We'll call the meeting to order. Everyone except Mayor Pankinen is absent this evening. Every except as Mayor Pankinen is here this evening. I'll be filling in as mayor. Uh, item number one, uh, call it to order. Item number two, does anybody have anything they would like to discuss on the regular session agenda? Jerry? I would like to ask uh, the airport, Deidre, wh how, why are we selling so much gas? You got a sale on it out there or what? Yeah. Yes, I'm going to defer this to um, the, the uh, authorities' advance. <laughs> uh, why, why don't you come on up to the microphone tell them a good news story? Yeah, I'll tell you a moment. It was all the news, that guy. So, Vance had shut down the, one of the outside runway yes. or the inside runway for approximately four months. Uh, during that time, uh, Woodring housed 11 T1s where all of the, uh, the pilots and the students would come out to Woodring each morning do their mission planning there, and then fly as if we were an outbase for Vance, and they did that for four straight months. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. <laughs> it was great for the airport and great for the city. And great for Vance. We appreciate that. I didn't know they were just being housed out there. I knew we were flying in and out, but that's fine. Okay, great. The, the next question is, uh, what happened with code, and why are we having to redo something there? Can Is that an easy... Yeah, it's, 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 it's fairly simple. Um, typically, t t really two, two things. Uh, when we send out bids, we typically send them out to a, to a standard bid list and anybody else that we're given. Mm -hmm. And our standard bid list has something like 40 potential mowers on it. Okay. Well, something happened and, and, and the solicitations didn't get out to all of those bidders. Okay. And additionally, and so maybe as a result of, we only got back, I think, four. And we like to have Need five yeah. because throughout the course of the season, um, people decide they don't want to do it anymore for various reasons, and then, that, and then we get down to a smaller amount. So I certainly did ask a lot of questions, too, and I think it's in our best interest to reject them in fairness and make sure we send them out to that complete list like we will, and then everybody gets a fair shake. Now, I realize that there may be some people that might end up complaining um, because that happens every time we do this. If they do, we'll just tell them we're, we're trying to be fair, but... You know, all we do is the best we can do. So, I, I, I think that's. I think we're making the right decision in asking you to reject those bids to allow us to redo it. Ken, well, do this you is, want to elaborate anymore? Okay. It's the best time of year to do it. Yes, mm -hmm. because I think our mowing is pretty low right now. Right? Yeah. Okay, great. That's all I have. Anyone else? Item three: Discuss the revised David Allen Memorial Ballpark lease. Gerald. I think, Carol, are you going to jump in on that? There, there, I, I'll tell you what, I'll start it. Um, and, and I think we've got school yeah, representatives. Yeah. Um, the David Allen Ballpark lease has been in existence for, I don't know, Carol would tell me, a long time since it was built between the city and the David Allen Memorial Ballpark Board or, or people. And it's worked very, very well. But over time, the Unit Public School System has, maybe all the time, has been the one putting the expenditures into the field. Uh, the city owns the property and the city pays the electric bill and maybe a few other things, but beyond that, they're, they're self-sufficient working with the, the school system. And uh, the school system is not explicitly mentioned in the agreement, so I think an abundance of caution, uh, particularly when they were going to make an improvement that Sam can tell you about and Bill and I very are here. They thought it was prudent and, and we thought it was probably prudent to talk about this revision. They've already, um, the version that we have and that you have, it's already been approved, I believe, by the school board and the David Allen Memorial Board. So, um, Sam or Bill, do you want to come up? And is there more you want to add? Or? Do I have to get me to come up? Just yeah, come yeah, up to the microphone. Okay. This is uh, Dr. Sam uh, Robinson, uh, the school's uh, CFO. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the concern that was brought and why I brought this to, to Gerald is that we were getting ready to make about $180,000 investment in turf the summer which we didn't make that investment and the school district is not was was not in the original agreement with the David Allen Memorial Ballpark in the city for that field however the school district has been taking on the maintenance cost of that field for quite some time there was an agreement with David Allen with the city that was in a newspaper article I believe from 
99, 2000, somewhere <laughs> there with Dr. Keithley, who he mentioned that the school district was going to take on the maintenance costs. So the only <coughs> document we had was a newspaper article where the school superintendent said he was going to do that. Nothing was official and nothing was, was in writing. My concern <coughs> is that if the Ena Public School Board or if this, if this group of commissioners <coughs> had to change and somebody decided that they didn't want Enid Public Schools utilizing that facility for the reason that was that we would be we would be left without a ball field. We would have hundreds of thousands of dollars invested into a ball field that we really didn't have any written authority to be utilizing. And the only the only authority we were had to utilize it was with an agreement with David Allen for concessions. And that that agreement said that we would pay for ticket takers, scorekeepers, those type of people, but it, it never had anything to do with the actual maintenance of it. And Ena Public Schools actually pays for the full-time groundskeeper at David Allen Ballpark. And so the investment is there, the commitment's there. Really, this agreement is not <laughs> asking to, to change anything that hasn't been in place for 20 years. It's just saying, let's get it formalized in writing so that way when we get 20 more years down the road, when maybe all these people that were sitting at the table in 99 are no longer here to talk about it or defend it, um, that those people that are in, in that position, the position I'm in, the position you guys are in, um, they have a document to refer back to that says, yes, Ena Public Schools should be using that field. We should not take that away from Ena Public Schools. They have been making that investment, and it is a true three-way partnership in this community between David Allen, the city, and Ena Public Schools to use that facility. And Sam, that's not going to affect any of the other schools and their tournaments that play down there. Nothing will change. Nothing is going to change at all as far as the way tournaments are done, the way other schools utilize it. There is one change that we did ask for, and that's um, there are schools that call when they have rainouts and they want to come play games there. The one change we said is that any public school should not pay the gatekeepers and the scorekeepers of those other school districts when they come in because that and that's typically what's been happening they don't bring enough people concession wise to even offset that cost so we did ask that when those school districts that are not affiliated with tournaments when they come in that we can at least charge them for the cost of that gatekeeper or that scorekeeper unless they bring <coughs> their own people in and then and then they can use the field just as is so who, who takes that phone call that that <laughs> goes through bill mayberry and our athletic director right now okay. so they'll be aware of the change and they know what to what the state to the to yes the that's right so the the intent is not to change anything it's it's really just to to get in writing and formalize it um, just to protect everybody down the road the other part of that that I that I didn't mention is that the David Allen board is in existence right now I don't know what Bill's future plans are I don't know what the David Allen board's future plans are but should that board dissolve there, there, really, there really was no one to take over running of the ballpark. The, the city had kind of, in that agreement, had left it up to David Allen to manage that ballpark. And so this gives, this also gives Ena Public Schools the ability, should David Allen ever dissolve the board, that it allows Ena Public Schools board to step in and take over the running of the David Allen ballpark, which is not too different from where we're at right now. I mean, we're, we're paying the maintenance cost of it already. It's just the board has direct oversight on everything that goes on at the ballpark. So it gives the school district, I think it's a 45 day, basically right of refusal uh, to not want to accept um, that responsibility, which is and, and another just to protection. clarify for the city, how it's great for the city and how it's been working is we have nothing to do with scheduling games or tournaments or running anything. We have our hands full with other stuff, so it's been a wonderful arrangement from that perspective. Um, we have uh, minimal involvement, like paying the electric bill, and if you need something, typically yep. we can help, we will, but, but it's not with the operation of the facility. And so it's been a great model, and a similar model we're going to look at for the new soccer complex that you're going to hear about sometime probably in the next month or two. Toys, I don't know if there's anything to add to that, or if there's any other questions, I'd definitely answer them. I would say today's the... We want to talk about it in study session, we'll give you a chance to see it, think about it, and then our intent is to probably bring it back on the 4th if, it's, if we think it's ready. If there's some concerns that you would like us to look into and address, I think we have the people here that, that can, can work on that. And It's been functioning so well. I mean, we've had, it has been such an asset, it's functioned so well, and if that changes, I mean, the city has, has some protection in here, and if some of this school district started running it really poorly or something that I mean, we are not without recourse. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, we have no reason not to be thrilled with the way it's operated so far. We just don't want to screw it up. 
Yeah. Exactly. No, no pressure. <clears throat> And, and by the way, we are looking at doing another investment there. Um, we're looking at upgrading the scoreboard and video board. And so when you when you put that together, we're going to be well over three hundred thousand dollars invested in that ballpark within a within the two year time frame. So we we want to we want to maintain it just as just as well for the city as we do for our own school district. So okay, thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Item four, discuss the 2018-2019 City of Enid and related authorities audit. Mayor? Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, <coughs> here tonight um, to go over the audit from FY19. Um, again, our audit from this year was RSM, and we have here tonight with us Mike Gibson. He's a partner with RSM that's in charge of our audit and our audit team. Um, the opinion on the financial statements is we have an unmodified opinion. It's the best assurance that the auditor can give, and I'll let Mike weigh in more on that and how that's done and um, explain a little bit more on that. I'm going to go over the management discussion analysis, which is about the first 10, 12 pages of the audit. It kind of gives a high-level overview of where our financials were as of June 30th. Um, for the year, we had... Um, slightly lower revenue in 1819 versus um, 1718 and we had much higher expenditures and on the next slide we'll go into a little bit about what makes that up so as we look at the revenues we had a decrease overall in charges for services a decrease in grants and contribution and a slight increase in other revenues um, some of the items that are going into those decreases are we had some non-reoccurring um, revenues coming in on grant contributions um, 1.19 million dollars from ODOT for the 66th road improvement that was not a repeat um, we also recovered in 18 one million dollars from FEMA from a 2015 ice storm that was not a repeat and so that those two together are a lot of why the great contributions are down um, we also had additions toward the airport terminal that offset that some in the year on the grant revenues um, overall our in increases expense by 16.7 million dollars a lot of this has to do with capital and how capital contributions are booked whenever we make an asset in one fund by building a sewer line or a street and then capitalize it back into EMA, the fund that funded those assets where they're held. And so we had um, contributed capital this year of $13.4 million. So that $13.4 million of that increase of that 20 million was due to those capital assets that were completed and transferred back to the municipal authority in the year. Um, we did have decreases or increases in the areas listed up here, general government, public works, public or utility operations, airport, economic development, event center, and transit, where we, they were offset by slight decreases in public safety, culture, recreation, golf course, and other. Um, a lot of it are one-time type expenditures that it come and go like a SCBA gear for the fire department that happened for one year. So there's um, a decrease when it comes off the next year. So it's just timing of when those capital expenditures happen. There's nothing very um, <coughs> out of the ordinary there, even though it seems like a large increase in one year. It's due to the timing of when all that stuff happens. Hey, Aaron. Yes. Where, give me an example of where some of those, that over a quarter million dollars for uh, charges for, for services. services gone away. What? Um, there were lower um, charges for services are going to be things like oh, franchise fees are part of what go into there. And so when we have lower franchise fees, that's lower. Or if we have less um, sales at the airport for the services we provide there or for um, the event center, if we have lower cost of doing um, concerts because we didn't self-promote, whereas if we self-promote, we have higher expenditures. So there are a lot of different things that go into those charge for services. Of course, utility services could be part of that too, but it's not just utility services. We provide a lot of services throughout the city that go into that category. Okay. Uh, to follow up on that, is, is that something that we budgeted for, Aaron, or do you economy driven or I think some of it is just due to timing because of the accrual that we have to recognize at the end of the year for something that we expected to receive and didn't necessarily receive um, 
when we look at budget to budget dollars, we came in under budget or at budget on most of the revenue line items in the year. So it's adjusting it from that cash basis to accrual for our audit. <coughs> And on the uh, grants, when it comes to the grants, do we have to apply for those grants every year? Yes, there are different grants that we'll apply for depending on the projects that we have to do and the things that we may qualify for. And so um, like for ODOT, the 1.19 million that we got for 66th Street, there's other projects that we're working on now with ODOT. In fact, they're working on the project at Cleveland and Chestnut. and. Okay we have a whole line of projects with ODOT lined out um, for several years. And so um, I know Safe Routes to School is another grant that we've done a lot of that has to do with sidewalks that we move from one to the other. That's one that we do typically apply for year after year, but many of them are not year after year type applications. They're available one time we apply for them and get them or don't, and then we'll do the project. Do we have to like apply for those years ahead or, or just it depends on the requirements of the grant itself. Um, some of them we do get year after year, like CDBG funding. We are entitlement community, so we do get that. We still have to apply for it and go through the whole thing every year. EPTA, we do the applying for every year. You see those on the agenda for us to approve, um, to apply for those grants. Thank you. Okay. Aaron, was one of the things driving the grants going down the airport? Because uh, we, or, or not? No. Okay. It's the FEMA ice storm, $1 okay. million, and then the 1.1, and it's offset by actually more grant funding coming in for the airport because the terminal, we started getting some reimbursements in 1819 for the grant terminal um, that had not came in in 1718. <coughs> okay, yeah, the FEMA was a one time thing, probably for an ice storm or something. From 2015, yeah. and we just got paid for it in FY19, yes. So that was a reimbursement for expenses we had back then. It takes a long time to get those room <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. All right. Um, when we move on to page six, this is a statement of net position. There are five categories here. We had increases in four of the ca categories, assets, deferred outflows, liabilities, net position, and we had a decrease in deferred inflows. And the future slides go through each of these areas, and we'll talk about what caused the increases and decreases to each of these areas. And just for the commission, something to keep in mind when Mike gets up there, ask him what deferred outflows and deferred inflows are, because when I went to a county school, that was undiscovered at that time. So those are like new elements that have been discovered. <laughs> all right. When we look at the numbers for all of those year over year, this is how it looks. We had um, total assets increased from 347 million to 457. Deferred um, outflows increased from 5.8 to 7.4. Total liabilities also went up 104 million to 197. Um, decrease in deferred outflows 6.6 .6 to 3.7, and then total net position increased from 242 million to 263 million. To start off talking about, about current <coughs> assets. So we had beginning of the year balance of 99.2 million. Um, we had an ending balance of 203. So change in current assets of 103.9 million. Um, the increases are due to three sales tax or three colleague <coughs> accounts. One for sales tax was an increase of 6.8 million. We also had two loan funds that had project dollars available, and then the 2018 FAP had 45 million dollars available in there, and the 2019 had 50.9 million dollars available. We also spent out of the 2016 FAP <coughs> funds 8.8 .8 million. So the net of all those together is 100 million that increased in um, restricted cash and investments of that 103. Um, other than that, we had a slight increase in cash of half a million dollars just from the flow of cash coming in and out for the year. Um, when we look at net capital assets for the year, we had a $5.8 million change in net capital assets. Started at 400 or 248 million and ended at 254 million. Um, construction and progress throughout the year, we um, added a net of $17 million to construction and progress and completed $3.8 million. So the net construction and progress um, activity for the year was $13.1 million. A lot of that is contributable to Call Lake and the activities are going along with that program and um, continue to be working on. Um, there are $8.3 million of 
that 17 million was related to Call Lake. There's 2.5 million in other water capital improvement projects, 1.3 million in stormwater, 1.9 million towards the airport, and 1.5 million in street projects. Um, the 3.8 million in deducts we'll see as we come down to infrastructure and buildings as they were capitalized this year. For buildings, we had 75,000 increase that was due to a remodel at fire station number five and the restrooms out at Meadow Lake Golf Course that were refurbished or put in, I guess new there, the prefab restrooms that we did out there. Infrastructure, we added 3.6 million. Again, we had 1.27 million in stormwater, 1.16 in street projects, almost 700,000 in sidewalks, and $500,000 in park projects that were added during the year to our infrastructure. Equipment, we had 1.1 million. There were uh, $460,000 for the 911 Motorola system upgrade that was approved as a lease for a five year term that um, was added onto there. We also had a gradle excavator and lay down paver for the street department to work on some of the street issues that we've been um, repairing. That was 351,000 and then some loaders and many excavators and other items for the public works department that made up that 1.1 million. Vehicles 2.1, we had 12 police vehicles, uh, 10 work trucks throughout public works and public utilities. We had a pothole patcher for street department, three new buses for EPTA, and we had $1.28 million in solid waste vehicles. We got three side load trucks, a rear load truck, a roll off truck, and a semi truck all for the solid waste department. They had a lot of equipment that was getting older and we were able to replace a lot of that in the last couple budgets um, to get that up to speed for them. So taking depreciation is about exactly the same level as it was last year. It was 14.3 some different change last year. And so we're right on track with what's rolling off and what's going on the books. And so net capital assets increased by $5.8 billion for the year. Um, Long-term outstanding debt, you can see we had increases of 97 million and decreases of 7 million. So. Um, other post-employment benefits is an actuarial um, projection that's done and it's based on our health plan and any um, employees that we have covered that are not age 65 yet and are still on our plan but retired. And so that liability that was estimated by our actuary increased $30,000 over the year. Our compensated absences based on what's on the books as of the end of the year increased $92,000. Landfill closure is a requirement that we have by Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality and it's based on the percentage full of the landfill and what it's going to cost us based on inflation and all these factors that we have to update annually, um, what it's going to cost us to close our landfill and the percentage in, um, that our landfill was full is 75% as of the end of the year, it was 73% in the prior year, so that did increase $77,000 on our liability for that for the year. Um, and when we add a sale, that it, does that increase the that increases the life or or not or no, it won't increase the life, but it does change our calculations because based on the square footage available, so it would only increase our life if we bought additional land so that we could um, expand the amount of sales that it held. We also had an increase in the city of Enid's net pension liability for the city of Enid's single employer plan that covers our non-uniform employees, and I'll get into the pension plans a little bit later. Uh, we had three new notes taken out for Call Lake. We had 2018 FAP and SRF loan and a 2019 FAP. Um, there was a total of $94.7 million increase there. And of the 20 million available for the F or for the SRF loan, we'd only drawn down 4.2 of that as of the end of the year. So it only shows the liability of the 4.2 because we haven't drawn down the other 15.8 yet. So that will continue to go on in the current year that we're in. And then there were three, no, two new leases added on the capital leases on this section. There was a Motorola lease for the 911 system, and then there was a lease with Arvis for three trash trucks that were on the increases. 
Um, decreases work comp reserve, that's based on the cases that come out and again our actuary goes through all that data and what we paid and what the claims are and the decrease there was $257,000 on the year. We had a decrease in net pension liability for both the fire and the police fund for the year, um, totaling about $3.1 million total between the two of them. Um, 2015 EMA note, we paid off 1.3 million of that on the revenue notes payable. And then the tax increment financing note payable decreased $2.1 million and that was the advanced food TIF. So that TIF number one is now paid off and, and um, no longer on our books. There are a lot more details about all of these debts on page 43 through 49 of the audit. So if you have more questions about what's payable within the next year, what the interest rates are, anything that has to do with any of these notes or how they're figured. There's a lot of details um, on those pages in the back. Um, here's a slide that's talking about net pension liability. So overall, as of the end of the year, our net pension liability for the three plans together was 25146510 um, this is a decrease of 1.91 million from FY18. So um, slight better, slightly better position for the year. Uh, both the Oklahoma police and firefighter pension retirement plans are cost sharing multiple employer plans. And so we participate in them as part of um, being in that program. The <coughs> employees contribute, us as the employer contributes, the city of Enid, and also the state contributes to these plans. And so we are assigned a portion of the share based on how many employees, active employees that we have in the plan and that percentage changes every year. And so we recognize our portion, excuse me, of what is there, um, what their overall plan is recognizing. Whereas our city of Enid single employer plan, we recognize the whole part of that. So we recognize 100% Whereas the police pension, we recognize this year 1.67%, and the fire, we recognize 1.78% of their plan. Um, the police and fire pension plans, because of the state funding, we get the reporting a little bit behind. And so when you see numbers for the police and fire pension, they are reported one year in arrear. So the numbers that we're looking at for police and fire pension are as of 630 of 18, where their plans were at, even though it's in our FY19 audit because of the timing of everything. Our city of Enid pension plan is actually on 630 of 19 end of year. So you'll see as we had a decrease here last year because we had a decreased liability, they have it one year following where they have better returns and they have that decrease. So. You, you kind of get an indicator from our plan where their plan may be heading the next year and what that improvement may be because of that lag. Um, overall, the police, or sorry, the fire pension, since we'll start here, their overall plan net liability was $1,257,723,000. Um, they had a decrease of $20 million in net pension liability um, from the previous year. Their plan is currently funded at 70.73% this year, whereas the previous year they were only funded at 65.42%. Um, their investments did really great this year. Their plan income was $210 million increase from the prior year. Um, and their pension liability only grew at 78 million. So overall, their investments grew more than their liability, so their plan position increased for the year. Um, similarly, for police, they only had a $7.7 million um, overall plan net pension liability, and they increased that from 55 that it was the prior year. So they actually have an asset this year on the books instead of a liability. So that helps offset the, the liabilities and others. That's why you see this negative going down here. They had the same type of thing where their investments <coughs> came in at 168 million and their liability only grew at 112 million. And so um, there was an increase overall in the police fund as well. The police pension, was previously funded at 99.7%, and now this year they were planned at, or funded at 101.89%. So 
the City of Enid pension plan. See, we did have an increase this year. Um, we did have a decrease in our net investment income. In FY18, it was 2.18 million, and this last year it was only $437,000 um, investment income, so it was down 1.7, and that's about our liability went up 1.8. So both our investments were down, and our liability was a little bit higher this year. We have questions on the pension plans. We ought to use the uh, yeah. <laughs> the firefighters' pension. Well, not I mean, the first year where the fire pension wasn't a complete you know wreck on our. When we had to, what was it? Three years ago when the Gatsby thing changed, and we had to realize a huge liability increase right in the fire. Yeah. FY14-15. That was expensive. The one drop we've had in our historical net position. That's when we had to start recognizing that net pension liability. Um, and that new Gatsby statement came on. So this is historically where we've been with our net position. Now there are a lot of things that go into net position, but I just wanted to point out that is that one dip here is where we came, where we had to recognize that um, police and, and fire, all pensions um, for that net pension liability. And then actually last year was the first time we had to recognize that um, other post-employment benefits for the health plan, that liability that that creates there. So and that growing upward trend is, is a healthy, <laughs> a healthy thing to see. It is healthy, yes. And, and on, on, on the city's plan, and you may have said it already, we're still at, are we still around 78 or 80 percent funded, something like that? Yeah, we're 81.88 yeah. percent funded, whereas we were previously 87 percent funded. So it's a slight decrease, but when we met with our actuary, um, the retirement committee, um, they didn't have air, uh, necessarily any concerns about how we were doing and the funding. Um, and we looked at some of actually the assumptions and other items that go into that report to discuss them with the committee that oversees the retirement plan. Okay. Um, so net pension, wanted to just kind of look at, or net position, wanted to look at it a couple different ways to kind of help explain some of the growth that happened over the year. So total net position increased $21.3 million. Um, when we break that out, there's really two main funds that that's caused by. EMA increased $6 million, and again, that is all tied to Call Lake. Um, <coughs> it has to do with how the funding comes in with the loans through EMA, and then also the next one, Water Capital Improvement Fund, how it flows over there so that we fund the projects through there. And Water Capital increased $7.8 million. And that's tied to um, contracts that are awarded and um, expenditures that happen out of those funds related to the Call Lake program. The other 7.5 is all of the other city funds combined. There are a lot of things that go into that, like this net pension and, and a lot of other things. Um, broke it out one other way to look at it based on restricted, unrestricted, and net capital assets. Um, unrestricted net assets increased 14 $8 million during the year. Um, 8.2 of that was in the Water Capital Improvement Fund. 2.7 was in capital improvement, um, multiple encumbrances or word projects that weren't completed, but they are committed on the financial statements are considered, considered unrestricted. Um, they can only be restricted funds if they're by enabling legislation, vote of the people, something that can't be changed by this body um, acting alone. So, even though you've awarded it, it still falls here into this category on the audit. The other $3.9 million is in other capital funds. Again, ca um, encumbrances and awarded projects throughout the city. Um, maybe stormwater streets, um, police, fire, um, whoever had encumbrances at the end of the year that were covered, basically. Restricted net position. This increase here was $5.9 million. We had $8.1 million. Um, restricted colleague sales tax in this one, that was a bit of the people, and then $2.3 million decrease in property taxes that had to do with that um, advanced food tiff that fell off the books. And so we don't have restricted funds in there anymore. And again, the net wash, net capital assets that we went through when we went through the capital asset list. Um, one other slide here, just GASB 88, um, Governmental Accounting Standards Board, they had pronouncement 88, 
It requires us to disclose a lot more information about what happens on our loans if we were to default, what are the default terms, what's the pledge against the debt. All those disclosures have been added. They're on page 87 of the audit, and I'm sure Mike can share a little bit more about that. Um, that's really what I have to go over. I'm going to let Mike come up here and talk to you about how the audit went, go over the opinions, and answer whatever questions you may have for him. <coughs> Mayor and commissioners, and Gerald, thank you for uh, thank you for having us. We're uh, we're glad to be here. And so, as Aaron mentioned, I'll just talk about. So our audit it covers two things, uh, and the audit of the city's financial statements and then also the audit of the city's federal programs. The, the, and we evaluate a, a federal, pro, you know, and select a major pro federal program. So, and the background, the audit generally starts around April or May. Uh, we'll have a conversation with um, Gerald and Aaron and determine what's changed and, you know, if anything we need to be uh, thinking about, then we'll, we'll uh, issue our arrangement letter to the city and, and we'll do some planning and interim work in the summer. We'll try to do some federal program testing if we can, and then uh, set out the time, a pretty good timeline requirements or time needs so that you know, we know when we want to issue the audit, which is um, on or before Christmas, <laughs> and and we work backwards from there. And and I will say, you know, when there's always target dates and stuff, and Erin is always and her team are always ahead of those dates. So if there's one or two things that are behind, we know about them in advance, and we just work around them. So so I'd like to start off by thanking Erin and, and and her staff for being fully prepared and ready <coughs> for the audit. Uh, a really good communication between them and our team, and that makes that makes. Th those are critical for a successful audit all the way around. And so I would say that this audit was, uh, a, a, was a good audit. We did have an unmodified opinion on the financial statements, as Aaron mentioned. That means that we believe, uh, based upon the procedures we performed, that they are free from material misstatement, whether by caused by odd or, uh, fraud or error. Uh, our audit is performed in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards issued by the AICPA plus government auditing standards issued by the Comptroller General. And so that's designed to provide reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance, but reasonable assurance that they are free from material misstatement, and, and we believe that they are. We also, because the audit is performed in accordance with government auditing standards, we perform evalu evaluations and report on the city's internal controls over financial reporting and on its compliance with laws, regulations, contracts, and grants, et cetera. And if there are any findings, if there are any material weaknesses in internal controls or significant deficiencies in internal controls, we'd, be, we'd report those to you. And uh, we're happy to say that we are not reporting any findings related to the city's internal controls over financial reporting. With regards to compliance with laws and regulations, we do perform tests over those various laws and regulations that if the city did not comply with, we think it would have a material effect, a material effect on the financial statements. And if there is any such things to report, we would report those to you. And again, there were no such items to report. So that covers the highlights of the audits of the of the financial statements. You know, Aaron mentioned I could talk about GASB 88. That, that really didn't, that, that changed some disclosures. It did not have what I would call a significant impact. It was just more of a, provided more inf information about, as Aaron said, the nature of, of your debt <coughs> activities and what would happen if you went into default. I will talk a little bit about future accounting pronouncements. There are a couple, uh, one that's in, a, that is in effect in the year that we're in right now, fiscal year 2020. It's on fiduciary activities. I don't believe it's going to have a significant impact to you all, but um, that's something that we will we'll talk. Just you're already reporting your uh, you're already for that that fiduciary activities are assets that you hold uh, and control, but they're not really yours. And that would include the defined benefit, the single employer defined benefit plan, plus the, the defined contribution plan. You're already reporting those, or the 401k, you're already reporting those as, as assets in your financial statements. They're not part of the, of 
your primary government financial statements so they don't get commingled with the general fund or the municipal authority or any of those other any of your other funds they're presented separately so i don't believe implementation of statement 84 will have a significant impact to you all because i think you're already where you're where you need to be next year uh fiscal year 21 uh, GASB statement and number 87 on leases comes into effect and that basically requires that any just about any lease that you have that you believe there's a reasonable possibility will you'll have for longer than one year you'll have to recognize an asset and a liability I don't think we've done enough work I don't think Aaron's I know we haven't done enough work I don't think Aaron and her team has done enough work yet to really understand what impact that would uh, would have I think this spring is probably a good time to start taking a look at that because because it could you know because when you do implement it you're going to have to, to make that implementation as of July 1. So we don't really want to wait until we're actually starting the fiscal year 21 audit b before we start looking at it. We'd probably like to have a, a, at least an understanding when we are auditing the 20 statements how material that might be to the to the city's financial statements. So that's our that's you know something we've talked about with 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 Aaron and her team, and that's just something we'll take a look at next year. So anyway. With regards to the federal program or the single the single audit of the federal programs, that's done in accordance with the uniform guidance um, and and the single audit act of 1984. That was amended a few years ago, and but essentially, because the city has had a history of good audits, we haven't had any modified unmodified or anything other than an unmodified opinion on your financial statements we've we've always done a single <coughs> audit and we've never had a mod we've never had any issues with issuing an unmodified opinion on compliance so the city does qualify as a low risk auditee this year we audited the CDBG grant we did have we did and we issue an opinion on whether we believe you comply with the requirements and we issued an unmodified opinion which we believe that you did comply with those requirements in all material respects we also do uh, tests of the internal controls over the over compliance and with the objective of ensuring that there is a that the internal controls are f sufficient to help it achieve a low uh, risk a low level of a, a risk of a compliance and we don't have any findings to report in that as well so so those are the highlights of our reports on the financial statements. I thought Aaron did an excellent job of, you know, going through the the results on them. And so I don't have anything else to to comment. So, but I can define. Thanks to Google, I can give you an actual uh, definition of deferred outflows and deferred inflows of resources. If you'd like it, I knew it conceptually, but to actually give you the the precise definition, I need to look it up. Would that be right, though? Would that be what wherever that comes from, gas or Gasby or Gasby? The, the the Gasby defined they, they issued a what they call a concept statement in June of two thousand seven and that's when deferred outflows of resources and deferred inflows of resources were first introduced, I guess. Well that's when they were first discovered. It was a <laughs> massive discovery. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I will. I, I won't go into the details. I will say that it never really had an impact to the city or to even most governments until until the implementation of the pension. There were a few things. The Gasby, first of all, they you can't just have anything that you want be a deferred outflow or a deferred inflow. It's pretty. It has to be what they define it to be. And then for most governments, for a lot of governments, the biggest impact, and for, for you guys, it's really the only impact is the for the pension liability standards and the theory or the pension <laughs> standards, which came into effect in 2015. And the theory is those things that the, you know those pensions are based on actuarial assumptions, and it's a very long-term view. Well, you know, a, a, a half a point or you know a half a percent reduction in your discount rate you know, can have a significant impact on that liability. And, and the Gasby was concerned that, well, if you were having to run that through your income statement every year, it would change, it would, you know, make results in your income statement where it would be kind of impossible to tell what you, you know, how it was, how you were doing. So they said, okay, well, some of these things that impact the computation of the net pension liability should get amortized out over, you know, a period of time. Well, they have to park somewhere, and they're not really about, and they're not really an asset, 
with, or they're not really a liability, so they park them as deferred outflows and deferred inflows. And that's the whole theory behind it, to kind of recognize the long-term nature of some of these transactions. So well, What I get out of that is Aaron understands it and you understand it, and I'm good with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have about uh, the, uh, the scope of our auditor, the results, or um, deferred inflows and deferred outflows or anything else. Uh, I have one question. Yes, sir. Actually, slightly re related to that, the, the section on deferred inflows references um, that the balance sheet includes succeeding year property taxes as deferred inflows. We don't, I mean, our property, is that just from the TIFs? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. So we collect it one year and it wasn't due payable until July 1. Okay. So it crossed over that this okay. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. But that was only from the TIFs. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's and that's it. And that is that is the only other thing that you have besides pensions, I think, that would, that would affect you. And that's not a huge number, so anyway. And it may have gone away now because there was only that one TIF, or TIF number one, which is the best TIF that paid off worth advance. Right, it's the only branch. The one that worked. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That has it. I don't have anything else. Anyone? Okay. Well, well thank you, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Item five, discuss 2019-2020 finance update. Mayor, Commissioners, now we're going to go over where we're at in the current fiscal year um, compared to budget. Um, so first of all, we're going to start off with general fund revenue, one of our big funds. Um, see overall where we are receipts here to date. This is through December 31st versus our budget for that same six-month period. And you can see that overall our variance is that we're tracking $24,000 behind in general fund. Um, Overall budget and then comparison to the total budget, we're at 51% of where we are budgeted at for this year. So overall, not any huge concerns. Um, franchise fees, 75,000, 70,000 of that is based on ONG coming in lower, which um, is coming in lower actually than our three or five year projections or three or five year histories or where we budgeted this year. So I'm not really sure what's causing that. They've paid every month and so I know it's based on usage and I haven't like checked it against the weather to see if we've had a, you know, cooler than average so that there's not as much air conditioning or what's going on there. But the majority of that is being caused by the ONG franchise fees. Um, other than that, court fees are down, projecting come in 165000 under. Um, I can tell from what we're collecting and passing along to Cledaphus and Forensic from those tickets, the number of tickets that have been issued is down. Other than that, I'm not really sure what's causing that. Maybe um, Carol or Chief could weigh compliance, in. Compliance, I'm sure it's compliance. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, everything else is minor in the scheme of things, I think we're tracking fine in all those other categories. There had been more of a variance earlier in the year, hadn't there? Did yeah, when we did an update before, we were only through August, so we only had two months of data, and so it, okay. it tends to stabilize out the more months we get into the year, okay. the closer we normally get to those projections. Um, when we're making our projections, we're basing them on history, and sometimes the month-to-month -month <laughs> flow can be a little different, and so we may we may think we're going to recognize more in the first six months, and it really may be in the last six months that we recognize, but we may come out to where we haven't budgeted. So um, just ebb and flow of how it comes in. It kind of looked like September was just yeah, bigger than September? everything else. Do we know why September was so out of whack? Sales tax? Yeah, and I talked about this at the, at the, at the last update that I did. In September, we had a one-time very large user payment on use tax for some pipe that was delivered here. I think it was over $8 million worth of pipe. It was a one-time thing. And Tax Commission did say be aware because a lot of times they can come back and ask for refunds because they may have paid it to the wrong jurisdiction depending <laughs> on where it's delivered because they're national places and they don't necessarily know where all the lines are and who they're paying it to. And so they do the best they can, but there are times, a lot of times that they'll come back and ask for a refund so they can pay it to the right jurisdiction. So they have up to three years to come back and ask for a refund on that. That's $600,000 in use tax for that one return for this one month. 
It was how much? Six hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Ooh, we need to spend it real quick. So <laughs> <laughs> they they have three years to come back, and they will take it from That's whatever they pay us in that month talking. that they asked for. So, <laughs> just to be aware of that, um, you can see the blue lines are where we came in last year. Um, the red line is where we came in this year. You can see we were lower in all but one month from where we were last year, and that was that one anomaly in September where we had the really large use tax return. Um, luckily, the green line is where we actually budgeted. We didn't budget as high as where we came in last year, and so that's helping um, <coughs> cushion that a little bit in this year. Um, as of right now, we are looking to come in I'll go to the numbers because it's a little easier to look at here with actual numbers. And so you can see we've come in under where we budgeted in each of these months and over in two of the months. So overall, we're actually tracking right now 54000 If we were to take off that return, mm -hmm. we would be 550000 behind where we budgeted. So that is a concern. I went ahead and took these numbers and plugged in. Um, anywhere from 3 to 6% lower, just because that's kind of where we're trending um, without that September number in there, to see where we come in at the end of the year. Instead of being 54 um, positive there, we were anywhere between 402,000 and 860,000 under. So if we continue on the trend we're on, we're looking at a shortfall of revenue in sales tax between 402 and 860,000. Um, by the end of the year. So we will keep an eye on that because we'll have to pull back in um, areas um, if we need to and make those adjustments and we'll have those conversations with staff and administration to um, see what we need to do there to make that work. Next fund is EMA. Um, overall, we are budgeted 100%. Uh, water is supposed to be Budget at 38%, it's coming in at 33%. Um, storm water, water, trash are all coming in within 1%. Sewers coming in 3% lower. And then miscellaneous is, was budgeted at 3%, but it's coming in at 14, and we'll talk about what's causing that. And then transfers were supposed to be 27 or 28, and they're budgeted at 31. And a lot of it's skewed because of this 14% number, and we'll talk about it here on this slide. And so what we have going on is year-to-date receipts in each of these areas versus budget and then the variance. Um, water again. Water's been difficult. I went back and looked at a lot of the history on the three and five year averages to see do we track even, do we track higher in the first six months, last six months. It varies every, every year. There's not a real consistent number coming in there. So um, a lot of this I don't think is necessarily based on the receipts, actually. I think it may be budget based on how much we have budgeted in, in each of the months. And so when we look on the next slide and we look at it compared to the whole year, you can see it, it's a lot more in line with where we're at. Um, landfill is coming in quite a bit higher. We've had, I think, three or four companies in August and September that did some pretty large dumps. Normally we have about $80,000 a month in landfill revenue and in August we had $128,000 in September we had $254,000. So just some large one time that we bill whenever they come and do those dumps and so they won't be, I don't anticipate that they'll be reoccurring but it will cause us to have higher revenue but also higher expenses um, for the tonnage that's been there to go along with that. Um, trash and sewer pretty well on track. Sewer is a little bit lower that, that typically happens. Um, May through September we have a little bit lower rate for residentials for, for sewer because of some people who water and other things that's in our ordinance that May through September there's lower rates. So um, I think that by the end of the year we should be fine. I think it's just due to those lower rates and it, I don't think it was budgeted for necessarily in the 12-month spread. Um, according to those lower rates in those couple of months. So that's something we'll look at whenever we do those split outs this next year. Miscellaneous, you can see we have 4.7. $3.9 million of that is loan proceeds. So whenever we draw down to get a reimbursement from our Call Lake money, it, it has to be booked as revenue at the end of the year. It'll get taken out of revenue and it will um, go as the debt on the books. And so it will 
end up going away. So in the end, when we take out that $3.9 million, the receipts here to date here are $30 million. Um, Thirty million and nineteen thousand um, dollars versus the thirty-three million, and so when we look at it based on percentage to the whole year, you can see water is coming in at fifty-two. So even though it's tracking a little high, I don't think it's as high as it was showing on the previous slide of that nine hundred thousand. I think it's going to come in closer to that twenty-two than what that previous slide shows. Um, sorry, um, stormwater landfill again is going to come in high. Trash and sewer, I think we're on track. Miscellaneous, whenever we back out that 3.9, it would lower it to 600 or 769,000 right here, and would drop this to 51% instead of 312%. And again, this would drop to 30 million, and this would be 52% overall instead of 59% once we back out that revenue. Uh, hotel motel tax is another main source of revenue. Um, high level of concern with what we're seeing here. We're seeing, again, a downward trend. Blue is where we were coming in last year. Red is where we um, coming in this year. And green is where we budgeted. So again, coming in, we had one month higher, but every month is coming in lower and even lower than where we budgeted. So as of right now, we're 15.8% under where we budgeted for the year which is $123,000. Um, again, I looked at this one and projected it out. If we come in 15% under in the last six months, we'll be ending with a $224,000 deficit um, or under um, projections here. Um, that one is a concern. Um, uh, 224000 equates to $84,000 less in payments out to Garfield County, but also equates to $140,000 that we would have to cut out of this budget. I'm not saying it can't be done, but I think it would be difficult. So I think if it does continue on this trend, I think we would have to come back with an appropriation from probably EMA to send it over to um, offset the operations for Spectra um, for this fund. So just a heads up, we'll keep watch on it and I'll be working with Kevin and we'll look at what capital expenditures and what we have going on there but it's a possibility that that's going to be coming back to you. Do we have some big purchases that we had budgeted in this year that we'd kick back to next fiscal? Or? Not a lot of big capital. We may be able to um, do some of that because we do have some capital money on the city side. Um, I'm not sure what all needs to be done and hasn't gotten done yet and so I'll have to have a sit down with Kevin and talk about that and we'll see what we can do and then um, bring back whatever we can't cover if we need to as those, sell, or as those hotel tax continues to come in. Or Kevin can make more money. <sighs> Got that, Kevin? All right. <laughs> All right, now we just have summary slides. Um, this is actual revenues, budgeted revenues for the year and what, what percentage they're at. And then expenses is not only expenses as encumbrances also, since those are committed funds, they're not available. And then what the budgeted expense are and then what percentage we're at. Um, on this slide, there are just a couple of funds that I wanted to talk about. Airport, um, Deirdre already updated you on that, but there is an appropriation tonight for her fund. We're already at 100% of expenditures and I'm sure she'd be able to like to pay her people tomorrow. And so it would be great if we could get an appropriation so that we can continue operations out at the airport tonight. Um, and the great news on that is the revenue's there. The, the revenue is all current year already in there or projected to be in there based on where sales are coming in. Um, yeah, $1.2 million. So The other one on here, um, EMA, again, this one is we're tracking over that five million, but 3.9 of it is the loan proceeds, and we are still tracking over a little, a little over in EMA expenditures from where I'd like to be, and I think a lot of that has to do with maybe some timing of encumbering some things for the whole year, like the Stover contract or some other high-dollar professional services. So I need to go look at those um, line items out to make sure that we're going to be fine there. <coughs> Um, is there any other funds specifically on this page that you want to talk about? The rest of them I think are tracking fine and I don't have concerns about them at this time. Yeah, okay. 
And then here's the last set of funds that we have. Um, again, there are a couple of our funds here. Um, capital project escrow, even though it has none, this happens one time a year, we do it in June, so not a concern there that we haven't spent anything. It'll be based on whatever projects we've completed over in the year that can come from those fundings and we'll reimburse that over to the stormwater fund who paid for those projects. So, um, Police, their revenue is actually lagging a little bit even though it shows 50%. They've had some turnover at the Oklahoma Highway Safety Office which is a pretty large grant that we get from there. And actually we just yesterday or today got the July and August claims finally paid as a reimbursement from them. So we'll get that caught back up now that they have some people back on staff to get that taken care of. So tracking that one. Again, EECCH, both of these numbers are tracking a little bit high and these numbers for EECCH for the event center, we do not have December numbers in here yet. I just got those within the last day or two and got those reviewed today. So I will get all that in there and then I'll meet with Kevin and we can go over what we can do in the fund um, to report back to you guys on that one. Fires tracking fine. CDBG and EPTA, both of these, their revenues look a little low. Um, that's expected. They're both federally funded programs, so their federal funding starts in October, so usually July, August, September, they have very low revenues. In fact, we just got October's um, expense claim back in January for EPTA, so not concerned. They it's cyclical for them, so I think we're fine. And why their expenditures are a little higher is they have um, some encumbrances that go along with that federal fiscal year. We've already awarded all those contracts to the CDBG, so they're encumbered, or we have buses encumbered for EPTA. In fact, we just put, I think, five buses out on the street within the last two weeks for EPTA, and we haven't gotten invoices to pay for those yet, so those will be coming too. In the next couple months, we'll, we'll reduce, which will free up some of this money because it's fully encumbered for the state's portion too. So I'm not. Overall, I think the areas of concern are sales tax <coughs> going forward and what we need to do for there. And then I'm looking at the hotel motel tax. And then we'll continue to work closely with any other areas that we see that may need anything. But airport has the appropriation tonight. and. We'll bring anything back that may need it. If there's any specific questions, I'm glad to answer those for you. Okay. Thank you. Item six, discuss bridge inspections, critical findings, update. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, we have seen this, pro uh, this presentation before. We are giving an update on what uh, critical findings were uh, completed and fixed um, the status of it. Uh, we have 76 bridges over 20 feet span, and uh, these bridges being inspected every two years. And uh, there were five critical findings were identified the the last round of inspection. Three were being fixed, and uh, the uh, on Broadway and Fifth, we are negotiating with an A and E uh, to do the uh, <coughs> inspection and uh, findings. And um, on the broad uh, market and 78th Street, we have the contract in place, so that it will bring back next commission meeting for award. Um, this is Broadway and Fifth Street. Uh, this is uh, uh, deteriorated concrete and uh, reinforcement steel. Um, the uh, right here, right now, it's been uh, uh, blocked off the street, and uh, any. Uh, a&E is on board. Uh, we are working with scope and fees. Um, Market and 30th Street, uh, like yeah, inlet, uh, in, uh, inlet and outlet flows, they're being deteriorated. Not deteriorated, like, uh, like uh, public works helped fix the uh, prep. And Market and 78th Street, uh, we got the contractor on board. This will come back next uh, commission meeting. This is where uh, the inlet and outlets are uh, it's been uh, undermined. Um, this is the plan where we are going to fix the uh, riprap, uh, uh, adding riprap and uh, to, uh, building a tow wall right there. Uh, and uh, Grand Avenue, North Turn. 
And Holly, could you go back a couple slides? I just had a question on the, on the. You're showing the crack in that bridge. Does something have to happen there, or is that, or is it, or, or is yeah. the tow wall and the other stuff going to fix that? Yep. Uh, the, like right here, when we fix uh, uh, reinforcement steel between these two right here, okay. that's going to uh, give support on the crack. Uh, on the north turnaround, uh, spalling concrete. Uh, uh, public works went and cleaned up all the spalling concrete, so it's back in uh, compliance. And then the south turnaround, um, there is a, a, a bearing canister being displaced, and public works well then put uh, put some steel and give a support to it. Use a bottle jack to lift that up and put that in. I don't think we we need to do any jacket. Two, <laughs> two, two bones. Two bones. A big bones. <laughs> uh, Randolph and these are uh, these are the four uh, five critical findings and uh, Randolph and fourth. We just want to give you an update on what's going on. Um, uh, this is uh, findings from the, the last inspection. Uh, deteriorated uh, beams uh, and ca caved in uh, a corner. And uh, the findings were, we knew, like there is an at and uh, duct bank. And uh, when we excavated, uh, the duct bank is in very poor condition than expected. And uh, <coughs> the relocation of the at and required to finish this project. And we are working with the utility company. And uh, right now, they are working on design and relocation. It How might long? take four to six months. Four to six more months? Yeah. We've had Fourth Street closed for that intersection closed for a year. A year, yes. And we're going to have, and it's four months of construction that we can't even start for another four to six months. Yes, sir. Who, who is that? Uh, it's AT&T. Why on earth does it take at and um, What we found out was uh, this cable, the, the, the fiber cables that goes through here, they were they provide service to entire east side of Enid, and uh, there were 2,100 strands, so there are like five cables. So just to splice them takes about a month each cable. Wow. So so what's the timeline on AT&T? Is that, is that four months or something? Four to six months, sir. Well, we haven't gotten a final word back from them, but we have told them that we need them to move out of it. And when we do get that answer, we will let you know. We will definitely. What what are they going to do? Move faster. Move to the other side. Yep. They're going to reroute it on the other side. So it's currently on the south side, and they're going to put it on the north side? South side, yeah. There's a duct on the north side as well. Gotcha. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Just that, that intersection is driving people nuts. Um, we'll work with AT&T, and it wouldn't surprise me if they don't hear about that from this meeting and talking about it. And so I, I know they are. Well, their building is <clears throat> on that same block. I mean, they're I diligent feel. about what they're doing, but like Marley said, it, it's not as simple as we'll just put another one in. I mean, I guess that's what they're going to do, but it serves the whole east side. So, yeah. so like it is that simple as put another one in. It's just a time consuming fix. Oh, boy. That's the, that's all I got. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Marla. We have nothing else, it appears. We will adjourn and we can be upstairs at 6 30. That's a lot of strands. <laughs> <laughs>